Hello. Just checking we're coming through on my end. Yep, that seems to be fine. Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to Assembly Online, event number 18. Um, tonight we have Archive of Destruction with Jess Fernie and Oliver Hines. Um, it feels quite fitting today, as I was just saying to these guys beforehand, that um, the shop below me is currently being ripped out and rebuilt. They're currently drilling into the ceiling underneath my feet, so you might hear the occasional thud. Um, I'll make sure my microphone is turned off after the introduction. Um, Jess probably won't give her much herself um, of an introduction herself. Um, so a few words from her bio. Jess Fernie is an independent curator and writer based in Essex. She's interested in art, architecture, feminism, literature and destruction. Archive of Destruction will launch in partnership with Flat Time House in London in spring 2021. I'm sure she will give a proper introduction and talk a bit about it before having a discussion with Olivia and then be around at the end for any questions. Um, I hope you enjoy. I'm going to pass over to Jess now, um, who will be leading tonight's event. Hi everyone. Thanks so much, Henry. And um, thanks to everyone for joining us on this particularly dark, bleak day. Um, it's so nice, I have to say, to be asked to talk about anything of my choosing. Um, and I've really enjoyed thinking about this um, paper this, for this tonight's talk. And also the previous programme. I mean, it's just so lovely, the um, poetry readings that I attended a couple of weeks ago just really fantastic and the feminist film collective talk took me right back to my days of cinema city I was born and brought up in Norwich there's a really great eclectic mix of um, talks and if anyone is just joining tonight for the first time I really recommend you check out the archive so for this evening's event I am going to talk about a research project that I've been developing over lockdown but actually working on over the last 10 years called as Henry says and rather appropriately the archive of destruction um, and I'm going to introduce the project and talk about a few projects in the archive, and that will take around 25 minutes. And then I'll be joined by Olivia Anais, who's an artist based in Brussels, who's joining us from Brussels this evening, um, whose work I recently learned about via a mutual friend, the artist Ingrid Burton Moine. If you're there, Ingrid, thanks so much. It's all down to you, this little collaboration. And we're going to talk about um, Olivia's project, Brussels Anti-Demolition Campaign, and for about 25 minutes. And then I hope we can open up for a discussion with you guys in the chat box for about 10 minutes. And we are aiming to be through by um, half past eight. So I'm going to share my screen. To full view. I hope that's visible to everyone out there. So I'm going to start with a story about an artwork by the American um, artist Robert Smithson called Partially Buried Woodshed. Smithson made Partially Buried Woodshed in January 1970 when he was invited to do a one-week residency at Kent State University in Ohio in the US. He'd originally wanted to do a mud pour piece, but apparently it was too cold. So he worked hastily with students to develop an alternative work, which addressed his interest in entropy and the accumulation of history. Now in my mind, and I absolutely understand I'm taking liberties here and I have just made this up. Um, Smithson's really cold and he's slightly pissed off um, when he realizes that he can't do his mud pour. And I imagine him kind of traipsing around the campus with this bunch of students in tow, trying to muster enthusiasm for an alternative proposal within his allotted seven day time frame. Um, that's the first 
image that I wanted to show, that's the work actually being made in, in progress. And then the second is the final um, piece, or not the final piece, as we shall find out. He finally elects to dump 20 truckloads of soil onto the central beam of an empty shed on the campus grounds until the structure cracks. And before he leaves, partially buried woodshed is officially transferred to the university in the form of a letter valued at $10,000. Smithson says in the letter that he expects the work, and I quote, to go back to the land and expresses an interest in the way that it would increase in meaning while its physical properties collapsed. This slow destruction was at the heart of much of his practice and is probably most widely co connected to his seminal work, Spiral Jesse, which he made just three months after he, um, this work. Four months after the work was completed, a student protest against America's involvement in the Vietnam War took place on the campus. This was a hugely febrile moment in contemporary American politics where support for the war was waning and protests by an increasingly vocal younger generation were taking place across the country. At Kent State University, soldiers shot from the National Guard shot at unarmed students, killing four and wounding nine. This incredibly shocking traumatic event was commemorated on partially buried woodshed with the words May 4, Kent 70 on the central beam. I think if you can see my cursor, I've got no if you can, but anyway, it's through, it's, you can see that just faintly there. Forever linking the work of art and the breaking point of the beam to the cultural shift that many consider the Kent State shootings to represent in US history. After Smithson's premature death in a plane crash, aged 35 in 1973, the artist Nancy Holt, who was Smithson's partner, lobbied to have the remains of partially buried preserved, but in 1975, part of, part of it was burnt down by arsonists. Despite their obligation to preserve the work, it was clear that university officials considered the remains an eyesore, as well as an uncomfortable reminder of a fraught historical moment over the ensuing years, groundkeepers removed all the pieces that fell to the earth. Today, what remains of partially buried woodshed is, a hit, is hidden in a grove of trees planted to actually obscure the ruin. And the grove is surrounded by a new science building, a football field and a parking lot. It's become a secret space used by students for illicit activities. So what I'm interested in here is that while Smithson had a pretty good idea of, of the driving narrative of partially buried woodshed when he made it, that is the inevitable slow release of the shed and its soil back into the earth, a rise into decline, he called it. A few months later, it turned into something very different, or at least its meaning expanded to accrue a new narrative. It was retroactively charged and became a signifier for one of the most vicious, disturbing and long running episodes in 20th century American history. Um, a more contemporary example of such a retroactively charged artwork and another one that's in my archive is Amina Menia's project, Enclosed, made in 2012. And I should say when I say my archive, that sounds like massively, ridiculously grand. I don't have all these documents or letters or photographs or whatever. I basically just have a massive Word document <laughs> that I will put into some form in a website and launch, as Henry says, in, um, in spring next year with flat time hats. It's more of a like a swanky database, basically. Anyway, so um, Enclosed is a research project that many are presented at the Sharjah Biennial in 2012. And the work revisits the history of Paul Landowski's monument to the dead, which, was, which is um, located in the center of Algiers. The monument was commissioned in 1928 by, the, by French authorities to commemorate French and Arab soldiers who died in World War I. The expressed intention, intention was to show the close ties that existed between the people of Europe and Africa, a sentiment most evident in the group inscribed in the frieze towards the bottom. That's around here. Landowski wrote in his journal when he was deep into the design of the work, the two women, the two old men, the European and the Arab lean on one another. The unity of emotion creates a happy visual effect, he wrote. To Algerians, the monument was a celebration of their subjugation and a painful reminder of ongoing colonial oppression.
and that's the work in um, in context in this kind of rather fantastic kind of lurid 60s tinted postcards there's the monument and there in that photograph so during the Algerian War of Independence that went from 1954 to 1962, the monument became a focal point for protests and public expressions of frustration about the progress of the war. 16 years after independence, tolerance for the monument ended. In 1978, the city prepared for the All Africa Games. An agreement was reached that it should be removed. One of the founders of Algeria's modern art movement, artist Mohamed Issyakhen, led a campaign to allow Isiachem to reclaim this physical manifestation of Algeria's colonial past by encasing it in a new memory of Algeria's socialist revolution. So instead of removing the original monument, it's encased in a new work. And that monument is inside that monument, just to spell it out. <laughs> the irregular shape of Landowski's original monument is echoed in Isiachem's bulging brutalist monolith a reminder of what remains entombed under the surface. The fe featureless abstract nature of the structure is dramatically ruptured by the inclusion of two powerful fists breaking free from their chains. As historian Henry Graeber has written, Isiachem's monument derives its power from its ability to both recognize and defy history. Isiachem's, and I quote here, Isiachem's piece speaks to the deep deeper political truth of post-colonial identity. The past, however painful, must be acknowledged as the foundation of certain aspects of contemporary society. It clashes with the National Liberation Front's desire to eradicate all vestiges of colonialism. Art allows a narrative complexity that defies the simplicity of official texts. And rather incredibly, in 2012, so this is almost 100 years after the original monument was installed, during the celebrations for the 50th anniversary of Algeria's independence, a crack appeared in the outer sarcophagus, which then began to crumble. Sections of the original sculpture, including faces and limbs, you can see them here. There's a face and a limb and a little face peeking through there. They became visible an ominous portrayal perhaps of the ongoing effects of colonialism, structural racism and power relations between Europe and Algeria. The monument was quickly shrouded in scaffolding and repaired. A debate developed between those who wanted to keep the shell and those who wanted to remove it. And for her Shahzar biennial installation in 2012, many re repositioned the memorial as a double monument, a metaphor for the complex and fraught Algerian-French relationship, she wrote in the accompanying text for her show. As a representative of the third generation of artists to deal with the memorial, I have chosen to place the works of the two artists in dialogue. Mohamed Issyakhem was obliged to cover the original monument, but he offered us the choice, or perhaps the responsibility, to accept or reject it. Reflecting on this gesture, I highlight unseen details, creating links where only dots were left. There's just a selection of the archival material that she put together. And then um, finally, she later produced a publication that included diary excerpts from Paul Landowski's diaries and her own, creating this really lovely kind of parallel narrative across time and genders and art forms and languages and generations. So over the last, 10 years, as I said, through conversations with artists and um, curators and friends and colleagues across the world, I've amassed this information of stories of this kind, the, the two that I've just talked about, um, about artworks and public space that have become a kind of catalyst for a conversation around, for example, political um, change or social ills, societal norms, colonial oppression and institutional conservatism. And I focus my research specifically on work produced over the last hundred years. So I'm not attempting to sort of go back 2000 years. It really is sort of modern and contemporary art I'm looking at. And I've devised various categories that reference the type of destruction involved in each artwork. So those categories um, are destruction through fear, greed, conviction, love, boredom, entropy, and rage. I've had, as you can imagine, probably a really nice time sort of selecting artworks for particular categories. And rather tragically, I think there's far, they're probably the biggest number of projects are in fear and there aren't many in love, but it does make the loved ones very special. 
So this research has led me to consider a multitude of questions that I'm aiming to grapple with in a series of commissioned texts and events and publications for this launch next year. And some of the questions I'm currently talking to people about include, if a public artwork is brought alive through the continual process of interaction and change, can it ever be finished? Can we claim that public artworks resist commodification or the logic of the market? If they're never finished, can they be sold? What role does fear play in contemporary commissioning? Fear of failure, rejection and loss of control. Can we move beyond the concept of the launch of a public artwork as its most complete state to one that acknowledges that this is just the beginning? And rather than a fixed authoritative historical narrative, can we consider archives to be open-ended, subjective interpretations created at a particular time and place? Or even as artist and writer Ines Schreber suggests, can we think of the archive as not only being a place of storage, but a place of production? I'm just gonna stop um, sharing the screen here. So in, in just this final um, section of my presentation, um, I'm gonna do a sort of synopsis of a selection of artworks in the archive that I wrote earlier this week. I really enjoyed writing. And it's a sort of stream of consciousness, um, so bear with me, um, which is influenced by two books that I've read over lockdown. Um, the first is Henri Lefebvre's um, The Missing Pieces. It's not actually the Henri Lefebvre, you might, might be relieved to hear. But it's, it's made up of a list of missing things from manuscripts and artworks, concepts and conversations. Things that have been lost through ignorance, accidents, blindness, inability, lack of will, terrorist attacks, memory loss, self-censorship, it's nuts. And it's just, you, it, you can see it's just sort of one sentence that goes on and on and on and on. Well, it's not really one sentence, there are bits, that there are dots, but it's basically a massive list and it's encyclopedic and it's brilliant. And then the other book is slightly bigger and it's called, um, Lucy, it's called Ducks Newburyport by Lucy Ellman. And it's made up of, largely made up of one sentence um, and a thousand pages. And it's written in the first person from the point of view of a, a middle-aged Ohio um, housewife. And it's also published by Galley Beggar Press, which is in Norwich, there's a nice link there. Brilliant publisher. Anyway, so this is a kind of collection of various stories from the archive. Oscar Wilde's tomb, carved by Joseph Epstein, located in a Parisian graveyard, rapidly erodes due to the thousands of lipstick-covered kisses that are planted by adoring fans on the limestone. Throughout his 61 years, Kirk Schwitter suffers from epilepsy, strokes, asthma, depression and hemorrhages. He was interned in a camp during World War II and fled Nazi persecution for his degenerate art. His four total environments, Mertzbarns, were destroyed by bombs, fire, dispersal and storms. At one of Jean Tangley's most notorious performances, Homage to New York, the artist is presented with a citation for disturbing the peace and violating the city code. His self-destroying sculpture, made up of junk he found at a New Jersey dump, has burst into flames. A firefighter brings the event to an abrupt end. It is inscribed into MoMA's history. The New York administration takes umbrage at Andy Warhol's screen printed portraits of the FBI's most wanted men applied to the facade of the New York World Trade uh, World Fair Pavilion. The work is called 13 Most Wanted. Is it too sexy, too risky, too Italian, too criminal? Warhol obliterates the work with his trademark silver paint a day before the fair opens. Local residents use Victor Passmore's Apollo, uh, Apollo Pavilion in Peter Lee, Durham, as a place to piss, to have sex and take drugs. The artist agrees to meet his detractors on site and tells the crowd that the activity and graffiti have humanised and improved on his work and suggested that the solution to the problem would be to blow up neighbouring houses. The artist Avita Giva unloads thousands of books onto a strip of land separating a Jewish kibbutz and an Arab village. People rifle through them. The remaining books decompose. Is this shared knowledge, social fertilizer, a reverse land grab or a refusal of the concept of land ownership perhaps? 
when Michael Ash's caravan is finally stolen after three episodes of, at Sculpture, um, three showings at Sculpture Project Munster across three decades, the police ask curator Caspar Koenig about the value of the artwork. Koenig explains that the caravan was not, and I quote, was not art when it was not parked in one of the designated spots. I receive an email from an artist curator friend who says she'd like to write a text for the archive, imagining where destroyed public artworks are now and how they feel about their new locations. Whether the sites where they once stood feel less burdened or lonely. I love this idea of embodying an artwork, speaking for it in its absence. Between midnight and 4 a.m. on the 27th of April, 1979, three Brazilian artists, Hudson Jr., Mario Ramiro and Rafael Franca, run through the streets of Sao Paulo, placing plastic bags over the heads of the city's public statues, fixing them in place with a cord. Within a few hours, the authorities have removed the bags, but the performance renders the statues eternally vulnerable. The memory of suffocation and the mass execution of revered leaders is forever fixed in the public imaginary. They become bodies whose identities have been stripped from them, echoing the lives of the disappeared of the dictatorship. I learn the word acephalus means without a head. I visit Alison Wilding in her studio, that was just yesterday, it was really nice, to find out more about a public sculpture she made for the River Weir in Sunderland 20 years ago. It was destroyed through erosion, malfunction, over-design, the building of debris, bombast and wishful thinking. At some point in our conversation, she said, but that might not be true. I can't exactly remember what happened. It was 20 years ago. And I really like the idea that I peddle half-truths, personal narratives, tenuous connections in the archive of destruction, and that this goes some way to filling the many gaps left by what remains undocumented and unspoken. David Hammonds takes the piss against a large public sculpture by Richard Serra in New York. His collaborator, Darwood Bay, documents the performance and ensuing conversation with a police officer. Is it staged? Does Hammonds hate minimalism, Richard Serra's art, the bullshit of the art world, or is he just marking his own territory? It's not clear. It's more interesting because it's not clear. When Katrina Fritsch's yellow Madonna is installed in Munster Town Centre in 1987, her nose is broken, her eyes are scratched and she's daubed in graffiti, uprooted and decapitated, all during nighttime hours. During the day, candles and flowers are laid at her feet and bundled into her arms. I wonder to what extent these acts are gendered. I become interested in the concept of shame in relation to destruction of public artworks and realise that this explains a lot when it comes to the lack of documentation about destroyed works. We are so desperate to tell the good story, the one with the shiny pictures and the smiley faces, the moment of arrival. Our idea of success is so wrapped up in all of this that it becomes almost impossible to publicly accept a moment of perceived failure. Eric Flanders, leader of Bow Neighbourhood Council in East London, orders the premature destruction of Rachel Whiteread's house, calling it an excrescence. I later learn that Whiteread witnessed the destruction from her car, parked clandestinely nearby, looking, and looking back, I'm shocked that I hadn't considered the emotional impact of this destruction, how it must have felt for all involved in the project when the first chunk of house was taken out of the sculpture. Alfredo Jarre builds a gallery in, small, in a small paper mill town in Sweden and burns it down 24 hours later. He wants people to see the worth of culture and fight for their right to access it. It works. When Mark Wallinger installs his TARDIS sculpture in the grounds of Oxford's Natural History Museum, it's dismantled overnight by Doctor Who fans wanting to acquire memorabilia for their collection. Michael Landy destroyed all of his belongings in a disused CNA department store in central London, including all the artworks he owned by other artists. I'm touched to learn that when he tells Gary Hume about his project, Hume insists on giving him a better painting to destroy. I can't find a source for this story, and I think maybe I made it up. Just a few more to go. Um, in 2020, a statue of slave trader Edward Colson is torn down, dragged through the streets of Bristol and thrown into the harbour by Black Lives Matter protesters in the midst of a global pandemic. A few weeks later, an established white male London-based artist, Mark Quinn, 
illegally installs a statue of a female Black Lives Matter activist on the empty plinth. Within 24 hours, the council has dismantled it and sent the bill for removal to Quinn's studio. Gustav Metzger embeds 21 upturned willow trees in a lump of concrete. The sculpture is installed in the garden at Whitworth Gallery in Manchester. The roots are insane, they're frenzied, and their refusal of the natural order point towards the multiple ways that we're destroying the planet. I have a meeting with a museum director in Denmark who later emails me a link to a YouTube video of a Giacometti sculpture, which is lowered into the ground each night at 9 p.m. and rises again at 9 a.m. in order to protect it from potential destruction. It's very funny, high art meets farcical performativity. I asked um, Henry to put the link in the chat box if you want to watch it later. Um, it's really worth a, a view. Um, and I consider how meaty the discussions here around the subject of vulnerability and paternalism. It's a really slight female figure, this sculpture. The slow reveal of the female form, fear, money, value and fame. I stand with a huddle of people in a wood by the sea in our broth, Scotland, on a cold November night, sipping whiskey, stamping my feet to keep warm. A group of artists called Henry VIII's Wives set light to one of their works, an enormous, beautifully crafted wooden organ pipe sculpture. The flames throw shadows onto the trees. It burns for hours. The performance marks the official ending of the collective 17 year partnership. In the morning, there are hot ashes and mist. A curator texts me in a rush just before going to pick up her kids. Did you see this? She says, exclamation mark. Trevor Paglin has just launched a satellite into space. It will burn up in the atmosphere in the future. This is future archival material. Does space archival in your project? Of course it does, I think. I'm delighted with this information. A few months later, the Nevada Museum announces that the satellite has been lost due to Trump's 35 day shutdown. Presumably it's still orbiting the earth, they say. Eventually it will burn up in the atmosphere. The story gains traction. So that's the end of my sort of stream of consciousness. Um, we're gonna move on now to talk to Olivia. Sorry, Olivia, I've kept you waiting so long to talk about her brilliant project, the um, Brussels Anti-Demolition Campaign. And just by way of a brief introduction, Henry, can we see? Oh yeah, you can, that's great. Hello. A brief introduction to Olivia. Um, she's a Belgian Spanish artist based in Brussels, where she's speaking to us from. She studied law in Belgium and Argentina, something we'll go on to discuss. She went, uh, she went on to study art in Brussels and London and is now enrolled in the HISC programme in Ghent in Belgium. And her work um, has been shown in many exhibitions from Lisbon to Paris, London to Moscow. She's really interested in lots of things that I think have a really beautiful link with the archive of destruction, including storytelling and shared authorship, belief systems, and also dialogue. But also really interestingly, I think a lot of her work recognizes the kind of impossibility of communication and the failure of narratives. So, Olivia, um, thanks so much for agreeing to be with us today. I know you have- Thanks for inviting. <laughs> Um, tell me how the project came about um, and where you were living and working in 2012 and how that influenced you. Uh, so Brussels anti-demolition campaign, the title in itself is uh, inspired by uh, uh, official campaign of uh, cities like, uh, for example, uh, Lebanon is a city that has been um, uh, destroyed over and over before even the bombing last year and there's been lots of association who uh, launch campaign to fight against the slow demolition of um, their uh, but their heritage and architecture the very old houses that you could find uh, until a few months ago in um, in Lebanon so that's an example but it's just to say that it's a very official name that many cities and countries use as uh, anti-demolition campaign so that's a title that i kind of um, borrowed and didn't make that up uh, but i am the only person in that campaign for brussels so yeah. it's a big name for a small mission <laughs> um and at the time in 2012 i was um i had finished um la cambre in painting and I'd started uh, as a copyright lawyer in a lawyer company in Brussels. 
um, and I, I kept my painting practice, but I was really um, eager to see what was uh, behind the studio walls. I felt that I needed to encounter uh, everyday people, that I needed to go out of the studio, that in a way the concept of studio as a place where you are surrounded by walls didn't fit my practice and so I started to walk around the area around my studio which is located south next to the south station um, um, train station in Brussels and it's a uh, it's a neighborhood where you can find a lot of um, houses that are being demolished because it's cheaper to demolish and to rebuild new than to renovate it and uh, I started to really get into all these architectural houses that were amazing and are, are part of the heritage of Brussels but they were demolished without any any double thought and at the same time in my um, cabinet yeah, as a lawyer, I I was working on cases, and one of them was really interesting. It was how it was a case of a Magritte painting, and how actually we couldn't touch uh, the 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 gallery. Uh, it was like a theater where the painting uh, was on the ceiling, and it was a really interesting case because the client wanted to renovate the ceiling, but they couldn't because they couldn't touch the, the painting of Magritte. And so that made me thought about the relationship between painting and houses and, and architecture and how one could influence the other. And, and then I set myself a very absurd goal was like, okay, if I paint on those houses and I become a famous painter, maybe those houses won't be destroyed. So of course I knew it would never happen. And <laughs> I kind of was looking for some um, purple, purposeless goal, but a goal that would, put me outside that would put me in the street where I would just be confronted not only with myself but with um, with the with the people that actually I was disappointed I've never met in uh, in gallery and exhibition spaces um, yeah like the people that I thought could be interesting to art but maybe sometimes are afraid to pass by at the door of a gallery or just think, oh, this is not for me, this is not for me. And so I kind of was looking for the encounter with that project. So okay. basically, yeah, I started to go around the houses around my studio and it, very easily I found the houses like the picture you've shown where you can see like, uh, je n'arrive plus à dormir, like I can't sleep anymore. And it's basically it's the first houses on which I painted. And it's, um, he was on his way to demolition already and the little girl i guess uh made that drawing to 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 share her feelings and this range of houses has been demolished and i've painted on a few of them just beforehand uh, i couldn't meet the family because i think the family already moved out when i found those houses i don't know where i guess even more in the suburbs of brussels i guess that's also this old process it was part of gentrification of the neighborhood um, and then I continue to look after houses uh, around my studio and then around my workplace, uh, around my house. And then I went in other neighborhoods in Brussels uh, where I didn't go uh, very often. And yeah, this whole, I was cycling and walking every time I had the chance to take a break from my uh, copyright law practice, uh, I was around and I've, um, yeah, I've kind of, in a way, I was looking for uh, encounter with passersby, but I guess I was also looking for some adrenaline, I would say, to be honest. Yeah, I think um, that's interesting. Because it was not legal at the time. Belgium had just passed a law um, incriminating this practice because lots of French graffiti uh, people were coming to Belgium because it was not illegal yet to paint on houses. But then it was uh, different at the time. And I knew that, uh, of course, I knew the law and I knew what I was uh, infringing in a way. So that was quite exciting. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine the adrenaline rush, as you say. Let's talk a little bit about what you actually painted and um, the scale of them. I love the fact that it, you had this mirror and you were painting what was behind you. Could you tell everyone the sort of process of that? Yeah, so one of the disappointment I had as a painter was that I, I thought like, okay, I can make a painting, but then it can be hanged 
everywhere. And so with that project, I had the impression I found, um, I would say, a solution to my problem that I couldn't solve with like painting that you can move around. It's like I wanted to find a context where the painting can only exist there. Um, so what I did, and I thought I invented that um, way of working, but actually I found out that it was a, a technique uh, from the 17th century that was invented by Claude Le Laurent already. And basically what he, he did, but I did it parallelly, I would say, it's like you put a mirror um, and then you, you paint what you see in the mirror. So basically I was fixing some very small mirror on the, on the walls of those houses and I was painting what uh, was standing in front a bit like as if the houses had eyes and I painted a whole year because I wanted all seasons to be part of the project. Uh, I, I very much wanted to have the snow at the time we had snow still and autumn and spring so and also I quite like to have a long project like one year long project to really and I, I wouldn't say embody the project but really get engaged committed and and have it as a um, as an ongoing thought in my mind. And, and then it also helped me to make the project evolve along the way. Um, and so for every painting, I always had my paintings in my bag, somewhere on the back of, of my bike. And I was mostly painting during the day because I couldn't, um, I couldn't see the colors otherwise if I was painting at night. Uh, and for example, this one, this little plant, I quite liked it because I painted uh, at a time where it was still there, it was spring. And then of course, over the winter it disappeared. And during the show we had at the end of the year with some friends, uh, I made a walk around the city. So uh, it was also an excuse like the painting where uh, an excuse to go in other neighborhoods and just cross over your comfort zone. Um, and for example, here you had the painting of the pen, but the plant had disappeared because it was not the time of the year where the pen would grow. So I quite like also to have this um, moment in the year where the painting would reflect the reality in front and then all the other months where it's, it was totally uh, disconnected, which I, I really much enjoyed. So that was my process of working and the painting are like quite small it's tiny aren't they I yeah mean, they're very you can see here that's a letter box they're absolutely tiny and what's so there are many things that are lovely about this project for me there's a sense of a real kind of friction or dynamic between the sort of real sensitivity and the sort of vulnerability of these tiny little fragile hand done um, paintings alongside this urban kind of um mass of materials and um you know stuff that is just made to last it's like a tiny little gift to the city and each one's yeah. the same size isn't it yeah so yeah basically i was playing also with the tags that already existed and with this so the painting took me uh averagely one month one month and a half to make uh, because I was painting first the white background and then I, I was painting with oil so I had to wait that it dried. So it was really like the opposite of a graffiti that you would do in five years and then you would never go back to the site yeah. uh, because yeah, of course it's too dangerous. So here I was coming back every week and I was meeting. And you were, you were doing people. it in Nantra, weren't you just preparing the paint before and then leaving work as a lawyer to work illicitly in the streets around your office, is that right? So uh, for this one, for example, it's one that I couldn't never finished. <laughs> uh, and, and then the tags were written afterwards, which I found quite funny because that's the one where I was arrested by policemen. And it was, yeah, as you said, uh, it was like a point of rupture where I had to choose, do I continue with that project? Because in my lawyer office, we had many cases of, of graffitis, etc. And I kind of understood I could not share that project with them and they would not understand. So for the show, I decided to change my family name and use the one of my grandmother for the first time. And this one, I, I was brought up to the police station and I had a big fight with the policewoman because uh, she said that uh, it was a, 
a drawing with oil and I was like you can't make a drawing with oil that's a painting she couldn't understand anything and then I she, love the fact you it. argued with the police officer about this that's she wanted to give a title to the painting I was like oh my god no I don't want to give a title so we <laughs> argue about the title I was like okay you can give a title like the moon and the sky if you want and then she was like okay no the earth and the moon and I was like okay whatever so yeah it was it was quite yeah. funny and I kept the the um, the police report after that um, tell us how how you were arrested in the first place I like the idea that basically you were kind of watched by various members of the public who lived in and around the area yeah so sometimes the neighbors were really enthusiastic about the project and sometimes uh some of them I mean one or two of them called the police in front of me and I was like they were like we I'm gonna call the police because you're doing something illegal I was like okay but most of them were really enthusiastic about it uh that arrest was made uh I was painting on the houses uh, um, where you had a lot of uh, immigrants uh, and unfortunately uh, they were arrested at the time on the Sunday morning when I was painting there and I, I was painting there so I get to know them so I was really on the way uh, for the police force I would say because they were like quite around 10 police force with uh, guns and jackets <laughs> I was like wow. oh my god this is happening to me yeah. Um, so I, 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 I'm not saying I was not stressed when I was surrounded by gun armed men, uh, but then I knew what I was risking. So I never told them that I was a lawyer because, of course, that would have worsened the things out. Um, but that just made me. That was the early months of the project, and I was like, "Oh my God, um, is is it going to be still possible to paint? What kind of trouble am I putting myself in?" And then I just decided to continue. I asked all my family, basically, and my friends, to be on the watch. Meanwhile, I was painting, so it became kind of a collective <laughs> project. Um, I couldn't go alone anymore because I, uh, yeah, I, I, I just couldn't watch and paint at the same time. And from that painting on you can see an evolution I started to paint a lot of trees because sometimes when the place was too uh, risky trees was quite easy to paint because you could you could um, shake a bit for trees doesn't really matter <laughs> so for example that one I shaked a lot but actually looks great for leaves <laughs> uh, and this one is still there uh, I quite like the, the house has been renovated actually and uh, it's an embassy I think there was always a long queue uh, in front of that houses and uh, that house and the paint is a bit fading but it's still there so I often pass by and just greet that's it's really lovely I think on the website and I don't know if it's up to date people can see here it's basically kind of documented whether the work is still still exists or not yeah so it documents it on the 2013 so up to now, uh, I think that this one existing and another two are existing, but you can download the map uh, at the time and, and print it and go around the city. And as I said, it was really like, uh, for me, those paintings are little details in the public space uh, for, yeah, they're not eye catching, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is really like to, uh, to be treasured, to discover by yourself. And uh, of course you kind of get have to know the map and have to know the project but if you make the effort to go around then it was a really nice walk that make you discover not only the painting but also neighborhoods where you wouldn't really hang out if uh, at the time I would say and because now it's like already seven years ago where you had neighborhoods like a forêt on the lake that are considered as dangerous and people wouldn't really dare to go to It's such a lovely project, I think. Can you just say how, a little bit about what, where you think the art, the work is now? What I'm kind of interested in is this idea that if a work is destroyed, where does it exist? And for me, it's about the kind of narrative and the storytelling. I mean, there's, it's so rich, all the, you know, the things that you've just said. But where do you as an artist feel that the work exists at this moment, given that you painted 21 paintings and that three now still of it are only still there yeah so I, I for me the so i i um for me i tried to renew the project when the house were destroyed i made a print of stones the stones of the houses that were destroyed and i took those stones and i uh, inked them and i took the imprint of them so for me it was 
uh, it was quite very emotional when I first saw the, the first houses being destroyed. I was being very logical about the project, but actually when I bumped into the first houses, the one with the drawing of the little girl, I was so moved. I couldn't believe that how moved I was. And I just didn't really thought of it. And I went on the site and I just took as much stones as I could. And it was a way for me to, to revive all these houses that were destroyed and, and those paintings that actually took me a really long time to make. And I put all my effort and heart and I, I was so much sick that, <laughs> that year because I was painting under the rain, under the snow. And so, yeah, I, I quite like this idea of, um, of destruction, of course, and some of my friends were like, "Oh, you should take that box letter, for example, the one you showed, and you keep it." And and I was really like fighting against it. I was like, "No, I really have to let them go." I knew, like, it was a choice from the beginning that it was an effort that would disappear, even though at the very, very bottom of my heart, I would hope that some of them would still last for a few years. And so it was a, an internal fight uh, for me to accept the destruction. And now, of course, I went around with a friend, a photographer friend who took decent picture of them and I've made a book of them and you have archive picture that I've shown in exhibition. Um, but it's true that it's not, the work has disappeared. And it's just a documentation or archive of what has once happened as the houses were destroyed as well. So it's definitely like a process that I didn't foresee would be as hard to accept that actually this whole effort was pointless. And um, and I guess that's where the work meets reality in a way. And where my acceptance as an artist to have given birth to artworks that were deemed to disappear is not only theoretical, it was also a very emotional process that I've, I'm still going through now. And as I say, I often pay, um, I often visit the few ones remaining oh. and I take picture of them to see how they evolve, etc. Like if I had little, like, yeah, little, yeah, little exhibition or kids or whatever around the city. So I say I have an emotional link to them. And even they are so small and people can think they are just so pointless. It's just, yeah, the um, at some point I was uh, uh, overwhelmed by emotion that I didn't foresee as um, a very um, theoretical or logical approach that I can have sometimes of my project. But actually, when you put all your body and all your time in a project, at some point, you you can't you can't control it all. So that it was for me a good lesson to accept to lose control over things. Absolutely, control has so much to do with it, doesn't it? And it's the same from curators' point of view. I think when I've worked on public um, commissions, it's really hard, and people don't really see it. I think if they're just looking at the working public to understand the emotional kind of connection and sense of care and um, respect and kind of love you have for these works and how fragile they are in this public space but that of course is what gives it it's kind of you know electricity the kind of the interest and you know the sort of vibrancy um, and I would say that what makes this project and many others in the archive I think really interesting is because I think the memory of an artwork can often become more kind of um, palpable or more meaningful through the act of destruction than something that just exists forever. You, if you just painted these on loads of work, buildings that still were there and there was no discussion of them being destroyed, it, it obviously just wouldn't be the same narrative. But I often feel this when I walk past the um, site where Rachel Whiteread's workhouse um, existed. I'm actually old enough to have seen it in real life. I think I was about 20 or something. But when I walk past it, I have this just incredible kind of, it's not just to do with the work, it's to do with sort of measuring out your life and thinking about who you were at the time when the work existed. And I'm sure you, you know, it's now 2020, you made this work in 2012, you know. It's, there's just a way of measuring time through destruction that I find really interesting. And also the fact that most people who talk about Rachel Whiteread's work I've never seen it, I, the, the house sculpture, I never saw it. So it becomes this kind of fable, the kind of tale that exists in the sort of, you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I, I have the impression that that work, uh, a lot of um, people really like this 
this specific work because they like the story more than the yes. visual or whatever archive they could find. They just like to be tell a legend in a way. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And I think that that's the the work where I, I I've put more of my. I didn't try to to put that much like uh, read a lot of theory beforehand. I really follow my instinct. Um, I, I just wanted to free myself from from studio practice, and I wanted to just I, I just yeah follow my my instinct. And I guess now I would never do that project again. Like some people were like, oh, you should do that uh, in London or somewhere else, and I was like. No, I don't want to repeat and repeat and repeat. I think it's just one gesture. And it was related to Brussels, where I grew up, and that's the city of my heart. And I would never do it again just yet, you know, to become like a, a trademark artist that would do small paintings in all the cities or whatever. So I really like to, it's just one shot. And, um, and the story become, um, take over the, the visual in themselves. And yeah. it's okay visual don't exist anymore so that website you have the visual on the map but you also have the story where I, I try to uh, so when you look about I try to tell the story with, with little anecdotes as much as I can um, and uh, if I show it again I think I will yeah try to develop even more the, all the encounter I've had because I was taking notes um, and uh, all the conversation I've had with the people that were um, taking a break from their work or going back from school. Or I had a lot of conversation with people about what was art, etc., uh, etc., et et that are not um, on the website now. But I think if I show the project again, I would definitely um, show the yeah the conversation I've had with uh, the people because it, it was also one of my goal when I was going outside of the studio is to actually talk about art with people that don't have a preconception of what art is of must be. Brilliant. This is everything that is, you know, it's like the perfect example of the, the archive of destruction. Thank you so much, Olivia. That's amazing. Henry, are you still there? Are you going to read us if there are any um, comments or questions before we finish at half eight? Hi, Henry. So now public can hear me too. Um, if anyone does have any questions, uh, do post them into the chat on YouTube and I'll forward them on to Olivia and Jess. There's about a um, 30 second delay before anyone will actually hear me saying that or post any questions. Um, so it's the YouTube excitement link. Yeah, the, the tense, tense waiting periods. I did post the, um, the video of the Jackie Mill Matty uh, sculpture. Oh, it's so good, isn't it? The yeah. tragedy is that that's only got 15 viewings. I don't understand how that's possible. I don't know if you've seen it, Olivia, but it's it's just so mind-bendingly odd. You know, the Giacometti sculpture. This is in a sculpture. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it, yeah. I saw it. And it, it me, your whole idea of the kind of, of potential destruction is really interesting. You know, this idea that, oh my God, we've got the Giacometti, this Giacometti sculpture. Um, when we bought it, Giacometti wasn't Giacometti, or at least he wasn't such a big, you know, cheese. And we, it was in the public realm, no one ma made a fuss. But then it became so valuable that they couldn't afford to leave it out in the public realm. So they decided to um, to engineer this really complex, probably really expensive system. And this tiny little fragile female form just kind of goes down into the uh, into the ground at nine o'clock at night and then comes up again in the morning. And the video is really cat candid. It's raining. There's some guy walking in. Out of I love it. I love it. It's so good, isn't it? It's just so funny. Um, you'll be pleased to know it's got 23 views now. So. Um... Oh, good. It's going up. Yes. Shaka is becoming quite well known now. Yeah, yeah, people would have heard of him soon. Yeah. That's good, we've made him. That's the outcome of this talk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no no questions yet in the chat. If uh, anyone listening does have any, do do post them. It's yeah. weird that we can't talk to people, isn't it? I sort of prefer being able to see people and talk to them. But um, anyway, it's there's no worries. It's a uh, 
Thursday night. And it's so dark here. I can't tell you. I feel like I'm just talking to the void. I'm just looking outside my window and it's just all blackness. Yeah, there's um, there's the internet, looking into the internet. Yeah. Um, the destruction of virtual spaces next. <laughs> okay, um, we'll leave it there then. I just want to say oh, a massive sorry. thank you. Sorry, there is a... Uh, oh, um, for Jess, from Rosie, I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about the idea of shame that you mentioned in relation to the destruction of public work. Yeah, that's a, thanks very much for that question. It's really, I think it's so interesting and it's, you know, each of these questions kind of deserve a whole kind of research paper in themselves. But shame, I think, is really a kind of key emotion that I think is connected to the idea of destruction of public artworks and it's not just on the sort of side of the artists it's I'm thinking sort of in relation to myself as a curator who works on, on public realm sculptures and um, installations and I, I think I've been thinking about it a bit and I think it's sort of there's a there's a sort of complex web but one of the things I think is interesting in relation to shame is I have this feeling and maybe it's just personal and I'm just you know saying all sorts of inappropriate stuff but I sort of feel like in the visual arts very specifically in the visual arts there's this sense of the emperor has no clothes and that if you just scratch beneath the surface there is there's nothing or at least that's what a lot of the general public think that maybe you know, and also i think we don't help ourselves with the language that we use the way that we communicate visual art is just unbearable and i think it's something that people pick up so when an artwork is destroyed or sort of affected in some way i'm using the word destruction really really in an open very very open way we feel it sort of gets to the absolute kind of nub of the issue in that we feel shit actually maybe maybe it isn't worth anything you know maybe maybe that's the end of the story someone's just decided to kind of smash this thing to pieces and there's a sense of kind of shame about what it is that you've kind of you know connected your, or spent your life doing in some way but there's also you know a kind of sense of shame from the commissioner's point of view there's all sorts of people involved in that or an in, there's an infrastructure involved in the commissioning program that goes way beyond the artist and the curator so you know it's the funders it's the um, commissioners it's the general public but i think on the whole i think it's um it really is a sense of shame about you know what it is that we're trying to do in the public realm as artists and curators um Paul Levy just saying he's going to watch the Giacometti video straight after this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I probably totally, I, I mean, really, it's like three minutes of crap YouTube video, but, you know, it's Thursday night, can't be too picky. Um, yeah, and I've also posted the, the link to the Brussels Anti-Demolition Campaign uh, website in the YouTube chat, um, and both, both the websites of the speakers from tonight. Um, also, the, the, the Giacometti thing, when it first started, reminded me a bit of The Square, the, the, the film The Square about artworks appearing outside oh the gallery. Oh my god, the Swedish film. <laughs> yeah, with things, um, yeah. things happening in The Square. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah it was a very, it's a very particular, very, you know, it's sort of oddly designed square, isn't mm, it? With yeah. purpose. And, yes. Um, yeah. Um, it reminded me rather of the there's a um, sculpture in Nottingham by James uh, Woodford, um, who he designed the uh, the fountain outside the Assembly House, um, and so I looked up his work and he he made a sculpture of Robin Robin Hood for Nottingham um, that had a load of arrows in his sheath, and the arrows or uh, he had one arrow on a bow. And that arrow was repeatedly stolen by people, and they kept like welding it on in different ways. Um, and now it's got to the state where they've um, there's no arrow at all, and you just have to use your imagination because they couldn't they couldn't make the arrow stay on well enough for the, like the way he was standing. It's um, so good the way that you know the public kind of just appropriates a work and just begins a new narrative and connection to it and adds to it considerably and does it often in a really witty kind of you know sensitive or funny way mm. adds a hell of a lot more to the original intent 
Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I, I've posted on some of my uh, Instagram, some of the paintings, some people repaint it over. And sometimes it was really funny. They just repaint it and put the, the number of the houses on it. <laughs> or sometimes they were just making little comments. So I really like the way they appropriated uh, some of the paintings. And I have, it's not on the website of the project, but in some of my uh, Instagram pictures, I've put them on uh, last year when I found it and I visit the painting again. I'm like, oh, so actually they, they like the shape. So they kept it and they made it useful in some way. So it was quite funny to see how they, you say, like other people reappropriate your work. Yeah, yeah mm. exactly. And um, as I think I made clear in my presentation, it's, you know, so much of this um, project is really about um, stories and people I know telling me stuff. So if anyone out there comes across any really interesting examples of artworks that have been destroyed in some way, just let me know. That would be brilliant. Mm. Um, OK, well, thank you. Just funny, and thank you, Olivia Hernandez, for that um, event tonight. And really nice to hear you read through some of the stories from from it. I look forward to um, seeing it in some form at Flat Time House. Um, just a quick word for <clears throat> upcoming events. We have um, in two weeks' time we have the next Oven by hosted by Jonathan P. Watts. Um, he'll be joined um, by. I don't have the name in front of me. Um, not professional. Um, there will be call, um, a talk called, um, I'll just get it so that I don't say the wrong thing. Um, I feel like I've been caught out, caught out in my own game. Um, you think so well, Henry. <laughs> um, I haven't got it. Um, I think it's called, it's called Fire Out, the, and it's looking at the, um, the history of the East Anglia drave scene um, by a writer who recently published a book on bleak techno. I'm saying it like a riddle, but it's, um, it, it is the title of the talk. Um, and uh, following that, on November the 26th, we have original projects from Great Yarmouth, who will be um, working with people from the Portuguese community on, a, on an event. Then there's two weeks off, of, oh no, then there's the 10th of December, which is uh, the, an international poetry reading with Kai, hosted by Kai, and then two weeks off for Christmas and New Year. <clears throat> and then we're back in January. And the programme will continue till end of, uh, end of April 2021, where it will probably stop or uh, leave more spread out. Um, but thank you both for tonight again. And um, if anyone does have any stories of demolition, please do forward them to Jess. Her details are in the YouTube chat, so you can see from there. Um, and do go and see it at Flat Time House. Um, I hope your works stay existing. And I'll, I really like the, uh, the mirror idea. I'll, I'll stay with you. Um, thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Henry. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Olivia. Bye. Bye. Um.